go ahead and get started. And, uh, like I was saying, we, uh, we get the after lunch slot here, so I'll, I'll try to keep you awake and not to put, to put you to sleep and uh, keep things moving. Um, a lot of what I have to say was just said in the, the session right before lunch, so that's helpful. Um, although we'll take it a step further, but uh, that was a good session, I thought, and um, both of them were. And, uh, and so it's exciting to hear from people who have a passion for discipleship. And uh, my name is Ron Crawford, and I know a lot of you in here, not everybody, but I'm with Man in the Mirror Ministry. I've been with Man in the Mirror for three years, and uh, uh, during that time also I was on staff uh, for four and a half years at two different churches as discipleship director. Before that, my wife and I were with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and uh, we did that for 14 years, and lived in Indonesia for 10 years, and uh, I went to do computer support and ended up mentoring local guys, teaching them how to do the uh, computer work, discipling them, and, and uh, God gave me a passion for life change in, in men's lives. And uh, we came home in 2009 and prayed about our next steps, and the Lord said stay home and do discipleship. So we, uh, we saw the great need that there is in the American church, and said, you know, we went, and uh, it's time to stay and uh, continue ministry. So. Uh, my wife and I um, are from, I'm from Chambersburg, we, uh, we met at Messiah College. I grew up at New Guilford Church, and the Lord brings us full circle, and we're back at New Guilford again. And uh, so it's great to be there, and we enjoy being part of the church. My wife works in the office there, and she enjoys her ministry, and, and uh, we enjoy working together in ministry. And uh, we enjoy um, discipling, mentoring, helping other people find who they are in Christ, and learn to follow Christ, and then of course, to take that next step to be a disciple maker. And so we've been doing that together for a long time and really enjoy it. We have five kids, uh, two grandchildren, and uh, so it's an exciting stage of life that way. Uh, it's hard to believe we have gotten that old, I guess, but uh, <laughs> another step closer to heaven, I guess. Yeah, but uh, anyway, it's exciting. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be here today to share from my heart what uh, the Lord has been doing in and through our ministry, but uh, mostly I want to talk about um, what we've been talking about already today, discipling, life on life, relationship, and um, uh, looking at, okay, we know we need to be making disciples, uh, what does that mean, how do we do that? Okay, some, sometimes we can meet with somebody for a whole year, every week, in a, a discipleship program like um, Discipleship Essentials that we just saw, that's one of my favorite books to use. And um, sometimes we can't get there. Uh, he asked earlier, who has been discipled themselves? I'd like to, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but have you been discipled? Has somebody sat down with you on a regular basis and walked you through God's Word, walked you through the things, the issues in life that you've been going through? Okay, a few of you? Okay, so a few of us have, but not many unless you're just not answering. But I'll say, too, that I never really had someone on a regular basis sitting down with me. I grew up in the church. I was saved at 7 at New Guilford. And uh, uh, you know, there were various opportunities there to grow, obviously. Sunday school, uh, junior church. We had a BBS. We had a really good uh, boys brigade program when I was there. And so I, I did have that input in my life. But I've never had that weekly or regular um, discipleship input in my life. And so, I know for me it's difficult to get to that place and to do that. And um, it, can, it can be difficult to, to do something that we haven't really grown up doing or, or been taught. Um, there are a lot of aspects to it. We're going to get into that here in a little bit. I would like to start us with prayer, and, uh, and then we'll move forward. So let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this workshop and for this opportunity to hear from others who are discipling, making disciples, following your word. Lord, we all want to do that, and sometimes we just don't know how that works. And so, Lord, help us today as we look at some practical ways of implementing discipleship principles, what those principles are and uh, what we can do with them. Lord, I pray you'll guide us with us here. Help us to keep our um, eyes and ears open. And, Lord, it's a little warm, and we just ate, and uh, so uh, we're all, I'm sure ready to sit down and rest, but Lord, I pray you'll help us to, to stay alert and uh, guide us, and we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so 
Man in the Mirror is a, a ministry for men, obviously. Uh, is anybody familiar with Man in the Mirror ministry? Have you worked with Man in the Mirror? Okay. A few of you guys have been to our training. That's great. Uh, so some of this will be reviewed for you. Maybe you can help as we uh, go through it. Uh, Jeff Smith is the men's leader at New Guilford Church, and uh, he has recently retired and come alongside me um, as a volunteer to help make connections with churches, and so I appreciate his help. And um, as the area director uh, for South Central Pennsylvania, my role is to come alongside churches and help figure this thing out, uh, how to disciple men, how to get men in, get them moving forward. And um, So what does that really look like in the church context? Uh, we heard this morning about one-on-one, -on -one, life on life. That's really where we want to get to, but uh, just as we heard Walt say, you know, you talk to men, you challenge them, sometimes they'll commit and they'll get through it. Sometimes they flake out. Sometimes they just are not ready to commit. So what do you do with those guys that aren't ready to commit? How do you get them moving forward? What, what does men's ministry look like? you have a men's ministry in your church? Who has a men's ministry in your church? Okay. All right. What does that look like? Uh, service. Gathering. Bonding. Okay. We're doing things that are that men do. Okay. Open cars, cut fires. <laughs> All right. <coughs> so we're doing some men things together. Doing some things to bond. Help build relationship, right? Okay. How many of you have more men in your church than you have women? Okay. That's usually not a problem, is it? It would be a good problem. I've talked to a few churches that have more men, and uh, those that have more men are engaging their men. So, um, yeah, the, the women more often are willing to get together to build relationships uh, to bear their souls. Men obviously are guarded and don't want to do that. And so how do we, how do we get men together in relationship? Uh, one of the problems, of course, we just we talked about not many of us were uh, maybe discipled one-on-one -on -one like we, we really should be doing ourselves. And so it, it can be difficult to learn that. And then when we look at um, our church, Specifically, maybe the church that you're in, but our church in America and where men are. And uh, I've got a video I, I want to show you, and uh, maybe you've seen it. Uh, listen to what the guy's saying and watch what's on the screen if you can, if you can read the words. So give us a picture of where our men are. Hey, I'm Ryan. I'm a Christian, and this is my story. Growing up, I never missed a home church. When I was 12, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I was even baptized. It, it undoubtedly was a very important decision. It even affected how I lived in high school. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I had fun on the weekends. I had a girlfriend, a couple, but I was a normal high school kid. College was one big blur, but I did make it to church out of obedience. And after school, I married a great girl, and she'd been a great influence on me. Life's been good. I have a house, three kids. I couldn't ask for more. I mean, sure, I worry about my future. I mean, my marriage, it could be better. And I need to spend more time with my kids, but, but things will be all right. I have my faith. You may not hear me talk about it a lot, but it's just because it's personal. But don't worry for me. My Jesus is real. Very good. Okay, how many Ryans do we have in our churches? Mm. How many of us are or have been Ryans? Okay, so, so we know what it's like. Um, our, our talk doesn't really represent our walk. And, uh, and 
the thing is, our, our churches are full of, of these kind of guys. And so that's one of the reasons we have trouble discipling men, is because how many Ryans are going to get into a 26 session or, or 52 week study? Sometimes they will, but very often we need to build that bridge first before they're ready for something like that. And uh, obviously the goal is to get them there. We, um, we really work towards life on life discipleship. <clears throat> but getting those guys to that point is, is difficult. Uh, when we look at the church, for every ten men in the church, I'll read these for you in case you can't uh, see it, but all ten of us struggle to balance life and work and family and, and just keep everything in balance. Nine of us will see at least one of our children walk away from the church. You see 90% or close to 90% of the kids that grow up in church today walk away. Many of them don't come back. Some do. Eight men don't find their jobs satisfying. Six in serious financial trouble, just barely paying the minimums on their credit cards. Half the guys in church are struggling with pornography, and of course they don't talk about it, and, uh, and so we don't see it. But uh, one of the major causes of divorce is pornography use, and all of these things lead to a breakdown in the family. And so these are men within the church. We're not talking about just our general culture. And so Ryan is... is uh, typical of the guys in our church. We'll get to the big idea here in a minute. Um, so I asked you what does your men's ministry look like? We named a couple things. Let's, uh, I'll write a few of these up here for us. Okay, so we said we had uh, wood cutting. Okay. What other kinds of things do we do for men's ministry? You named a few here. Breakfasts. Okay, breakfast. Archery. Okay. Hear about the car shows. Motorcycle rides. Okay. Being with them in time of need. Yeah. Okay. No needs based. Okay, so maybe we could go on and make some more lists here Bible study or um, fellowship time, uh, Super Bowl weekend or something. Uh, these are things that we call men's ministry. And uh, if somebody comes to you as a pastor and says, hey, I'd like to start a men's ministry, what's your first thought? Send Moses. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, no. Send Aaron. <laughs> you mean the, like if you're a pastor and somebody comes to you. Right. Mm. Pastors are good guys, and I know that you want your men to be disciples. And we can't all do it ourselves. We need to have those men around us that are disciple makers that we can guide and help. But... Uh, Sometimes we get that man that comes and he says, hey, I'd like to start a men's ministry and I've got a great idea. And uh, it may work, it may not, but sometimes even when it works, it lasts for a little while and then it's gone. And uh, what we're looking at um, often is this kind of men-only activity. They're sometimes ministry-based. Sometimes they're just uh, relationship-based or activity-based. Um, things that men like to do, like you said, we, uh, we obviously want to reach men where they are. Um, when we look at a men's ministry, how many guys from our church actually get into those activities? How many of you have every man in your church involved in some kind of men-only ministry? So we can reach some of our guys that way. We can reach some of our guys in one-on-one, uh, -on -one, year-long study. For those guys, we want to do that. It's great. And for the guys that we can get into this, it's great. How many men do you have in your church as opposed to how many men are involved in a men's ministry? Do you know where all your men are? One of the things we want to look at today is, is uh, where are men and how do we reach them with um, an all-inclusive discipleship process. And, uh, so we can, we can start things like this, and we can get guys 
in and moving forward. Those are great. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those. Obviously, those are good things to do. Um, when we do this, if we have a breakfast and we have 20 guys come, the next time we do it, 25 come, we count our numbers, we say, hey, this is great, we're growing. Over time, you know, it may fluctuate a little. Um, we have a, a wood cutting session and, and help somebody get their firewood for the winter. And we get a lot of guys involved. Those are good places to get men plugged in and serving in a non-threatening way. And, uh, and we count those numbers. And uh, like we talked about earlier, sometimes some churches count, some, most churches count, some don't. But, uh, and obviously we need to count because every person we count matters. We want to make sure that we're reaching people. But what about um, the guys that are outside this circle that aren't going to walk into this circle? What about the guy that's on the praise team? What about uh, the guy that works in uh, children's Sunday school? Or Awana here at the Five Forks? Children's ministry. These guys obviously are busy too. They're doing some things in the church. You don't want to pull them away from that necessarily to get them in here, do you? Because they're already in a place where they're serving. They might not be a... a mature follower of Christ like we talked about earlier, but they're at least in and they're connected to our church and they need disciples. And uh, so we could fill this around um, with a lot of other things where guys are. They might be an usher, they might be uh, you know, the maintenance guy in the church. Um, so we have a, a bigger circle here of people that are connected to our church. They might not get into a men only type ministry. They might not get into one of these things, but we want to make sure they're being Discipled. How many more men do we have connected to our church that we maybe don't even think about or don't know about? What about um, the children that are coming here but their dad doesn't come to church? So he's kind of outside the circle, but he's still connected, right? What about the UPS guy that comes and delivers packages to the church? What about you guys where you're working? If you're working in uh, the workplace and uh, you're connected with some guys and you know they need ministry. It's, it's uh, not always easy to open up and talk to them, but those are connections we can make. We have a lot of women in church, we said, but uh, more women than men, so where are these ladies' husbands? How can we connect with them and seek to disciple them? I don't know whether it was Walt or who was, but, you know, I agree that it's easier for me to talk to non-Christians about and, and getting to know them, getting to know where they're at, responding to them, being a friend, but also injecting aspects about my faith. But it seems there is such a disconnect in the church with people that attend church. They do not want to have any kind of anything deeper than coming in for an hour and leaving. So to me, sometimes it's just been like running into a brick wall. The other aspect is, you know, you've started off talking about, you know, pastors, and I think, too, laymen should be, because pastors are busy, laymen should be the ones that are helping really a lot in discipling other men. But if there's a man that would come to me as a pastor and say he wants to um, lead a men's fellowship or something, to me, as I have read, and I believe, because we see it in Scripture, someone needs to, like the pastor still needs to be the one to say, I'm behind this. I'm behind this ministry. I'm behind man in the mirror, whatever. And and this is the way we're going to need to go. And, and they, too, need to play that role. Do you agree well, with that? Well, and that's, that we're going to be talking about that here in a minute. Um, one thing that I've seen, and uh, just recently, is a, a man that I've talked to a number of different times, uh, leading the men's ministry at his church. And uh, he had some no man left behind a type training for man in the mirror, uh, what we'll be talking about here on that, that chart. And uh, the problem was he was not willing to listen to the pastor and, and really carry the vision of the church. And he was removed after about 10 years in that position because he was not willing to to really carry the vision of the church. He had his idea of what should happen. We don't want to go there. Um, that, that's what happens sometimes. That's why pastors, as I was saying earlier, get you know, kind of uh, you know, 
stand off a little bit when a guy comes and says, hey, I've got a great idea, because he's seen it before, and uh, sometimes he knows who that man is. When I go to a church to work with them, I uh, will often get called by a, a man who's passionate, and uh, I'll talk to him and say, okay, let's talk to your pastor and see where he is. I want to make sure that he's on the board and, and saying this is the guy I want to be leading this ministry. And usually it is, not always, but uh, we want to make sure we have the right guys in. So, we want to look at a process, and man in the mirror exists. Um, okay, first, the, this big idea is uh, measuring success, not by counting these men coming to the men's ministry events, but in evaluating, are we producing what we said earlier, mature male disciples. So, of course, we're looking at ministering to men. Are we producing mature male disciples? So, that's, that's kind of our, our measure of success. Uh, when we look around, the numbers might be growing, or they might be shrinking, but what's going on with our uh, men, and where are they? And so Man in the Mirror's mission is to help create that environment where um, the Holy Spirit then inspires men to engage in life-on-life -life discipleship. So, we can have the bigger groups, we can have smaller groups. The uh, Discipleship Essentials works on triads, usually three or, or maybe four guys. It's a good model. Um, and we can get right down to one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And that's really where we want to be, life on life, uh, a man discipling a man, a woman discipling a woman. And, uh, and so one of the things we want to get rid of is this idea of men's ministry. Okay, here's a men's ministry. This is where we want to bring our men and uh, disciple them. Uh, like we said, that not all the men are going to come. So we want to look at how to create a ministry that reaches men and disciples them where they are. And, uh, so we're going to be looking at um, uh, the chart that you have there. I'm going to be uh, going through that. And, and uh, as I go through it, we look at the, the real goal, uh, making mature disciples, making mature male disciples, and making sure that we're working towards heart transformation, getting them into God's Word and God's Word into them so that their hearts are transformed and not just behavior modification, which has been a lot of the discipleship in the church over the last few decades. You have an extra but, chart. Yep. We need to stop drinking. We need to stop smoking. We need to stop running around. We need to be good boys. We need to be good husbands and fathers. And it's all about the behavior. And we have men that are, are there. Their, their behavior is okay, but in their heart, it's still dark. And uh, uh, Mark, you mentioned about guys that, um, that can't be bothered. And uh, sometimes there's more behind that than what we realize. Usually there is. It's not just a lack of motivation, but uh, one guy I worked with in a church. Uh, he had been involved. He was very active. And uh, when I got there, he wasn't. And the pastor and the elders were saying, I wonder where Jim is. Why is he not here? Why is he not leading anymore? So I started meeting with Jim one-on-one. And uh, sitting across the table, he said, you know, I've never told anybody this, but my wife and I are barely married. I've got an explosive anger issue, and uh, she doesn't love me anymore. They're still living together. That's about it. So he, he's not at a place where he feels he can minister himself, so he's not going to you know, get involved anymore. And, uh, and sadly, he quit meeting with me. He didn't want to work on that issue. It was easier to keep it quiet than to do something about it. So that's where men are, just like uh, Ryan. On our chart... Okay. Man in the mirror, okay, so in our, our mission to help churches create an environment where the Holy Spirit inspires men to engage in life on life discipleship. Man in the mirror has been doing this for about 30 years, and uh, as they worked with churches, they come up with this set of principles that they found churches that were doing these things were being successful or effective in reaching men and discipling them. And, uh, and our founder, Pat Morley, was um, a businessman, and, and so he... Uh, you know, he, he came from that business mindset of, of uh, the good to great, uh, Jim Collins. Uh, what are these churches doing that's, that's so different? And so put all these principles into a model that was easy to remember. We're going to go through that model uh, piece by piece. I'm just going to give you an overview uh, because there's not time to, to get into it in detail. But this is kind of, uh, as you're looking at your church and how to get men engaged, What how do we think about that? How do we get from this kind of men's ministry to really engaging the men in our church. 
as we go through the model, there are uh, we're going to fill in the words on, on the various pieces there, and it's awful small on the screen, so I'm going to try to write it for you here as we go. So we're going to start with the foundation. The bottom piece on that foundation is the portal priority. The portal priority is discipleship. Okay, I hope you can read my reading too. Okay, so the, the underlying thing of this whole model is discipleship. We're not talking about men's ministry now. We're not talking about uh, creating more events or a program. We're not talking about uh, certain materials and resources. We're talking about that heart transformation, getting a man in, getting God's word into him, and the life transformation. So discipleship, everything else on this um, model is working towards discipleship. The second thing there is the man code. And that just simply is the environment. And we're saying we're, we want to create an environment for the Holy Spirit that inspires men. And so looking at our church, and are we welcoming men? Are we creating uh, an environment where men feel comfortable to come? Uh, many of our churches have been feminized somewhat. Uh, the music, the, the decoration. Uh, it's not just that. Um, we look at, uh, you know, the men that are in the church already and involved. Are they welcoming new men that come in? Um, it's, it's looking at that whole environment and making sure that we're creating that environment where men can come in and get connected. Okay, and then the next one, and this is a, the critical piece we were just talking about, the three strands of leadership. So a, a pastor who has that vision for discipleship, who can give direction to his men, can help the men understand that vision, where this is what the church is working for, uh, here's what we want to see disciples look like in five years or ten years, and uh, so he, he doesn't have to be doing the things that the, the men are doing to get them there, but the, the senior pastor is, um, is critical in this in this part, making sure that uh, he's giving that direction, the men understand the vision, and then we need a passionate leader, one who wakes up every morning, says, who can I disciple today, who can I connect with today, and uh, so that's on his mind all the time, the reaching men, discipling men, making sure that, that men are learning to follow Christ, and then a man that can lead leaders, and is able to recruit a team of guys around him, then that becomes kind of a planning team, um, a spiritual guidance team, uh, the guys that then draw in others to help uh, make that men's discipleship run. And, um, and so then they look at, at the ministry of the church, um, and through this process there's evaluation of leaders, there's evaluation of our ministry, um, right from the, the vision that uh, God's given the pastor right down to where the men are currently and then how do we get them to where we want to see them grow to be disciple makers. So that foundation, the three strands of leadership, the man code, and the portal priority, that underlying vision of discipleship. The next section, then is um, the top line up there, and this is an important one as well. As we look around our church, we're looking at where men are, we want to get to know our team, we want to get to know the guys, where they are. We talked about, you know, some of the guys are in this circle and men only stuff, some guys are serving different places around the church, some guys are connected to the church but not really coming, or they come once in a while. Uh, where are they spiritually? So we call this our um, wide to deep continuum. And um, so when we talk about um, where men are spiritually, we want to cast a wide net to begin with, and so that means it's going to be a little more shallow, not as deep spiritually. You're not going to get a guy 
um, who's not yet a, um, a follower of Christ to do a, a, an in-depth study of Revelation normally, or Hebrews, or the Old Testament. Um, and on the other side of it, the guys that are on that deep end who are wanting that meat of the word, uh, you know, you're not going to reach them usually with um, another car show or a, uh, you know, something they're not interested in. And, uh, and so looking at where your men are along that wide to deep continuum, starting on the left there with the natural man, the guys who are not following Christ, the guys who are in the world, who uh, their main concern is me. Just, you know, I want to live my life. And then the cultural Christians, those are the guys that uh, may have prayed that prayer and uh, are coming to church sometimes. Uh, this is Ryan. Mm. These are the guys that uh, they come when they want. Their, their picture of things is me and then maybe God. Uh, maybe God with a small g. Uh, so their main concern is themselves and you know, I'll go to church when I need to or I'll go on Christmas, Thanksgiving. I'll go to the, you know, the event that's coming up with my kids. Uh, they're doing a program at BBS, so I'll go and watch that. So the next, the next one then, culture Christian, we want to get them further down this line uh, as we start working with men. The biblical Christians, those guys who now have turned it around and their focus is God. I want to live for the Lord. I am following Christ. And, uh, and still concerned about themselves, um, but they're, they've turned it around. They're, they're doing their best to follow what God's Word tells us to do and, and uh, becoming the mature disciples uh, as we get down the line there, then the leaders. These are the guys that uh, do want to go deeper. Their, their concern is now God and others. I've seen what God's done in my life. I want to get out there and help somebody else now to uh, learn to become a follower of Christ, to give their lives fully to Him. And so along that line, from that wide end of the natural man down to the leader, that leader may go to some of these other things that we do just to bring a natural man along or a cultural Christian along. And so as we get them further down that continuum, the guys that are um, they, they're getting it and they're now turning around and making disciples. And so getting them to be that mature male follower of Christ or male disciple. And then across all of those, we see the hurting men. And all of us get there at some point. We uh, lose a loved one, we lose a job, struggle financially. It could be uh, you know, one of our children walks away from the church, gets into things that they shouldn't, and uh, causes us grief. So there are hurting men, and uh, sometimes we can see how people in the church are hurting men. And so we do want to make sure that we are ministering to them as well. Here at 5 Forks, we have a Celebrate recovery that helps deal with some of these things, and uh, sometimes it's the one-on-one -on -one counseling and discipleship that helps. So the five types of men on that wide to deep continuum, looking at where our men are. So when we decide that uh, we're going to develop something here to reach men, we want to know where they are, we want to know um, where they are spiritually, roughly, and, uh, and then be able to track that and know that, yes, they are progressing along that line and becoming mature male disciples. So how do you find that out? If we got a lot of men like Ryan, mm -hmm. then and say he falls someplace between the natural man and the cultural Christian, that's not his talk. That's right. not what he's going right. to tell you. Right. So that's now you've got all these people right. showing up at these programs, and the program is, you know, so you have a car show, you have a breakfast, you have whatever else. Hey, well... Nice to see you. See you again next month and take care. Hope everything's going well with you. Yeah. And that seems to be what it's all about. That's often. How do you get beyond that? that? That's this right here that we talked about earlier, this middle circle. I had a guy, I knew him about two years. You know, he knew the lingo, Christian lingo. And um, some things didn't seem right. But. He come to find, you know, he didn't know the Lord. Come to find out, 
and um, but you really had it was like pulling teeth to get to the point of being able to say to him, you know, you don't your relationship with the Lord is not there. But um, it was hard to pick out. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to pick it apart. I just figured he was. Yeah. I never had any question that he wasn't. You can't tell the difference, almost, mm -hmm. until you know there are some pressure points, maybe. But uh, that's a very hard one. So he he sort of hit it. It's hard to tell. Right. So that's where, as we're developing this process, uh, we need to get to know the men, and we're not looking to build that circle of men only events. Again, we're trying to get away from men's ministry altogether. We want to minister to men. So we want to know where these guys are that are in this outer circle, who they are, what they're doing, and getting to know them personally. So one-on-one. -on -one. it's We're working our men down this line to where they become leaders who are discipling other men. And that, again, is life-on-life, -life, relationship-based, one-on-one, and very small groups, where you can get to know the guys and... Um, and then you, you find out these things that uh, they've got a, an explosive anger and uh, they're estranged from their wife even though they're living together still. Uh, that's, that's where then you can, you can make the difference. Again, it's, it's every willing man. And, uh, like Jim, he wasn't willing. Uh, he didn't want to continue to meet. But uh, we can pray for him and hopefully at some point he'll circle back around and we can reach out to him again. But working with that huge group of men that are here, or, or between natural and, and cultural Christians, and, uh, and working with the leaders to understand it's their responsibility to come back to these guys and to lead them forward. And so, developing You still have process. to identify them. That's where I think, it, that's where I struggle a little. How are you going to identify them? Because you have you leaders. You're going to find them in church there. Well, you have leaders that are there, you know? You do, you have leaders. Right, right. Yeah, well, we're not talking about guys that are elders and, and deacons and those kind of things. Even some, I've met pastors who are back here. Yeah. And, uh, and so, obviously, that's, that's a difficult situation. But again, it's the, the getting to know the men. So that means I have to spend time one-on-one -on -one with some men. And Jeff spends time one-on-one -on -one with some men. And you need to spend time one-on-one -on -one with some men. And, uh, and so again, like uh, Walt talked about this morning, it's about taking the time, mm -hmm. setting aside that time, inviting and challenging another man. And uh, as, as we work with them, our goal is not just to walk with them, help them through life, but it's to point them to other men and help them become disciple makers. So again, we're not talking about men's ministry, we're talking about life on life, relational mm -hmm. disciple making. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I kind of put it in context because we, we, we can get lost in the phrases mm -hmm. and uh, yet, how do you identify? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I, I look at it this way. Look for someone that you would like to build a friendship with. It, it really, that's where it starts. Someone that you just want to hang out with. The hope is that it will develop into a discipling relationship, but it starts with just a basic friendship. Somebody yeah. who you have a common interest in. Could be cutting wood or watching football or whatever it is. Have a cup of coffee and see where it goes. Because nobody nobody wants to be your project. You know right? right? Yeah. Okay. But where I'm getting at, you, okay. Now you got two leaders. Uh -huh. <clears throat> hey, Walt. I want to be a friend. And so now we get to be friends because I really don't know that much about you. Yeah. And we can both be leaders. When we're really looking for somebody that's down there on the wide end that we need to disciple. So we have to have some kind of an understanding or discernment or insight into who those men are. Oh, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's and we can't always tell because we've got right. the guys like Ryan. Yeah, so you're starting with, with some of the things that are already going on. And you're being intentional just about talking to those guys where they are, getting to know them where they are. Um, and we're going to get to that here in this model. That's... It's in there. Okay. Uh, but really the goal is getting to know your men where they are on that wide the continuum. The next part, that conveyor belt, getting the guys in and getting them moving forward, we're talking about an all-inclusive ministry to men. So again, it's not, uh, not just the breakfast. Um, it's not just the guys that will come to a men-only event. 
They're looking across the whole church. Where are your men? All inclusive administrative men. So identifying uh, where your guys are and uh, and finding ways to reach them. So now you're looking at um, you know, having a, a way to connect with a guy, uh, looking at giving a guy what he needs in the context of what he wants. And um, and as we get the, on to the next section here, you'll see that more the wheel that drives that conveyor belt. We call it create, capture, sustain cycle. It's a cycle of um, connecting guys. And so you, you go through this. So that's where sometimes you have a car show, a breakfast, a wood cutting ministry. And you're looking, first of all, that whole thing revolves around the vision that your church has for reaching people and the vision for your men, what you want your men to look like, what you want them to become. You're, uh, you're developing not just an activity for activity's sake, but again, that discipleship that vision and, and what you want men to look like. So you, you're inviting guys to something, hey, we're having a car show, but maybe you're inviting them to an opportunity, if, especially if they're down here and, and you want them to help with that, inviting them to reach men through a car show and getting them connected that way. The create, capture, sustain part, the, the top there is create value. Um, how many of you have been to... Um, a Promise Keepers event or a, a big conference. Okay. I remember 1995, I went to D.C. for the uh, Promise Keepers event there. And uh, 50,000 guys all singing and, and hearing good teaching and stuff. And then we went home and went back to work Monday morning. And what happened? Where did it go? Where are those guys, that 50,000 guys, that should have been a, a huge impact in our country? We create value. We have that big peak. We get them into something and we teach them uh, something they need to hear and understand, but what do they do with it after that? How do we make sure they do something with it afterwards? Accountability. Okay. We bring them to a car show or a motorcycle ride. We, we can invite guys to a motorcycle ride. They don't really have to even come into church. Maybe they come bring their bike and head off with the guys. Um, okay, that was a fun ride, we're done. Go home, what happens afterwards? So we want to create value like that, but we need to take that next step of capturing the momentum. So this is where your leadership team that we talked about sits down and says, okay, we've got some guys that like car racing, why don't we take a group of guys to the car races and each one of us will invite somebody that's not connected to the church or they're connected but they don't come and uh, we'll hang out with them. We call it the ministry of hanging out. Uh, we'll take them, we'll get to know them. Maybe it's a guy that is connected, you find out he likes racing but uh, you don't see him very often. Uh, he's a cultural Christian, you don't know that yet maybe but uh, hey, you want to come to the races with me, we're going to hang out Friday night. And you have an event like that, but at that event, then you are looking at what is the next step with this guy. Hey, we're doing something else, you know, let's invite him to the next thing that we're doing, or let's uh, meet for coffee next week and you know, we can talk about our favorite racer or something. And you start to build that relationship. You find ways to create value, get them together, and, um, and, uh, and begin to build that relationship. And you capture that momentum then by giving them a right next step. Find out a little bit about who they are, uh, what their need is, uh, offer them something else, and again, um, giving them what they need in the context of what they want. Always in every interaction, trying to give guys a next step, a right, appropriate, fitting next step that will help them move another step closer. And again, this is this is a, not a you know, pray this prayer and you're done. But, uh, we're looking at, you know, down the road, five, ten years, where's this guy going to be and how are we going to get him there? This is one more step in that direction. And then the next step is to sustain change through connecting them to something of value or meaning. So, uh, so maybe if we look at an example of what this looks like, um, a 
How many of you have a, a men's retreat? The church has a men's retreat. Does anybody do that? How about a... I did, actually, yeah. Okay. Or uh, maybe a, a cookout or something. So your, your team, your leadership team sits down and says, okay, we want to reach guys in this area. Uh, here's something that, that these guys like to do that can help lead that. We're going to invite guys into this. Uh, and then let's follow up with uh, maybe a real short study. They're not ready to get into a, a year-long discipleship essentials yet. Uh, but how about a four-week or six-week study on a book that is relating to what we were just doing? Okay, so maybe it's a, an archery shoot. And then you, you follow up with just, hey, let's go through um, uh, looking at life from a deer stand, Steve Chapman. And uh, it's really like something that isn't real threatening. Uh, it might be, you know, they'll, they'd be glad to discuss, yeah, oh, I've sat in the deer stand and had the same thoughts. And so you give them uh, that next step. And then beyond that, you say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, cutting wood for a family um, that uh, the husband, you know, just uh, was in the hospital and, and uh, they need their firewood cut. He's not able to do it. Why don't you come along and help us? And so giving them another way to connect and get a hand. And so, in that cycle, you keep going through that cycle of let's invite guys into something, let's get them moving forward. For some guys, the first step might be another guy's third step. But uh, as your leadership team then is looking at your church ministry, the vision, where we want to go, what do we want guys to look like, where are our guys on that wide to deep continuum, let's take a group of guys and, and do something over here. Okay, so church-wide, you don't want to always just be doing men-only things. So church-wide, you've got, um, you know, maybe a, a church um, festival or something. And uh, lots of opportunities for guys to get in and get connected, just get their hands on to, to help with that. Casting the vision for, hey, we're going to be doing this for the community. We want to serve the community. There's a guy, maybe he's a barber. And uh, he doesn't come to church very often, but he can cut hair. And, hey, let's get him connected to the uh, event coming up. And then at the event, you know, working with them, having somebody one-on-one -on -one connecting with them. So it's that life-on-life, -life, relational connection in the, taking guys where they are um, and moving them a step forward each time and uh, working with them as they're willing and, and able. So, working with uh, Jeff over at New Guilford, we, uh, we did one of these um, cycles last year where we, uh, we did a seminar. And it was a Friday evening, Saturday morning, invited a bunch of guys in. And uh, we taught them about uh, moving off of that inertia and taking responsibility for our, um, our own spiritual growth, getting into a group of guys that can help us lock arms with us, and be there for us, have our back, we can have their back. And then from that, right at that event, we got them into a six-week discussion group and went through Galatians. And uh, it was just you know, a real thin booklet of, of some questions and things to think about. It wasn't a big, thick book to read or anything. Um, we had five churches brought guys to that seminar. And um, New Gifford had about, what, 12 or 13 guys, had 24 guys in that follow-up study. Um, another church in Chambersburg brought seven guys and had 24 in their study. And it's just a, a small church of about 70. Got them moving forward, had a, another follow-up event for them. And, uh, and the church right in town I, I talked to this year, and he said, you still got 12 of those guys connected. One guy stepped up as a leader and is leading the, the men's effort there. And so it, it kind of it, you know, grows step by step. It's not going to come together quickly. It's a, a long-term view of how to get guys into this cycle, get them moving forward, give them a right next step, and keep them moving forward. And again, it's about building that relationship. So it's an intentional strategy to help you guys get connected. Now you said, you know, like we talked about there, the uh, different things you can do, uh, like the uh, ministry types, like the wood cutting and stuff like that. Those things are all good, especially like, the, and I could see their aspect of being used but I've often thought, uh, you know, if you have somebody that doesn't really know the Lord, uh, the fellowship part's good, but you're going to be have to be uh, actually very intent on your focus, that you're going to try to lead into that, because 
you need to be teaching them that faith in Christ is not works. See, we all have a tendency, even as we, after we come to know the Lord, that we, I do this, this, and this, and I'm serving the Lord. And I, I don't want to have somebody leading them, well, we're doing all this, and that makes them okay with the Lord. I don't want them to think that right. way. I want them to know that they do need to know the Lord and have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we always ought to be a caution when we have these uh, activities, which are good and helpful, useful, uh, but also at the same time implementing the whole idea of, hey, this is not works-based. Faith is not works-based. It's, it's, uh, it's like the transformation. It's not the behavior modification right. situation. Right. So, um, so always, yeah. I, I, one, of, one of my very first disciple guys that I disciple was a neighbor of mine. And how him and I became acquainted is he played basketball, I played basketball. And I put up a hoop just for him so we can play one-on-one. -on -one. We played one-on-one -on -one basketball for a whole year before he said to me, by the way, what do you do? Yeah. For a whole year. Yeah. Didn't say nothing about discipleship. <clears throat> didn't say nothing. He went. He came over to our house. We ate together. We went to his house. Ate it. His kids played with our kids. And after a whole year, we're playing one-on-one. -on -one. We're playing one-on-one -on -one even when the weather is cold and we're too freezing to go out there. And after a whole year, he said, what do you do? And I said, well... You know, I work with youth programs in our church. He says, why didn't you ever tell me that? He says, why didn't you ever tell me what you do? Why didn't you ever tell me that that's what you did? I said, why didn't you ever ask me? And he said, did you think that I would have been offended? I says, no, you just never asked me. You know? He became a leader in the church. You know, and I think, I think, we've, I think we're missing like one, one element of this discipleship building is you got to become a friend, right? So this person can trust you, mm -hmm. and you got to not you got to not have this mindset that this is a candidate. Right. You know, mm -hmm. this guy was hurting, and I just happened to be the one God chose. You know, and and it, it's awesome how how we help people not just because not just because we have to. Right. We got to get rid of this mentality that we have to. I'm, you know, we're automatically should be discipleship making people if Jesus Christ is Lord and Master of our lives. That's you know, Walt said. We're, we're, that's one thing that we, as God's believers, we do. And I just feel that this friendship, getting down with them. You know, this. I mean, we play basketball, and I knock him down, and he cussed at me. He called me all kinds of names. You know. And he still didn't know what I was, you know. Yeah. And, and and we just we just had a lot of, you know. He yelled at me. I yelled back at him, you know. And <laughs> I wasn't afraid to do that. Yeah. Well, I didn't cuss at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to, but I didn't. <laughs> well, see, along with that, the transparency. You were probably transparent with him in your own life, and didn't make yourself look like you were perfect. You know, I think I find that helpful because I I like to probably too much make myself vulnerable to people that, I'm, that I care about in order then to feel that they might feel comfortable to start to open up. But see, as Christians, we want to look like we're perfect. Uh, but so the vulnerability is important. So and, one of the things, and I know it, it's difficult for me, is when you have a passion to reach men and disciple men, you see a need everywhere and you want to meet that need. And so that's part of what we're talking about here. How do we connect with all these guys? Well, not any one of us can disciple 10 or 15 or no. 50 guys at a time. We might have 100 guys in the church. and We can't be doing that. And that's why, again, we go back to that leadership team. And as a team, looking at what is the most effective way to reach the guys that we've got here and getting those guys who are down on this and, and, and are truly there spiritually, not just guys that are leading in the church, but you know, I've, I've talked with guys who are you know, elders or deacons and <clears throat> never open their Bible and you know they, they don't really know what it means to follow Christ. But 
uh, we're talking true guys that are biblical Christians and, and becoming leaders who are discipling other men and helping the rest of the guys in our church to connect in a way that they can build those relationships and disciple other guys and get them into the discipleship essentials life on life long term uh, process but like I said we're not going to get everybody there right away we can't disciple more than one or two at that level um, at a time but we can be making connections and building relationships and having coffee with somebody having breakfast with somebody inviting them to something that, uh, you know, that our guys are doing together whether it's wood cutting or car show or a church festival or whatever it is, connecting with guys. So our team talks about, okay, we're having VBS, there's going to be fathers here, let's connect with those guys and just strike up a discussion. It's not let's connect with those guys and disciple them and you know, have them pray a prayer, but let's connect with those guys and, and start building a relationship with them because those are guys that come onto our property and, and we have that opportunity. We don't have to go out looking for men, they're here. But let's start to build those relationships and hope that we can connect someone in our church that, can, that connects well with them and is able to and disciple them. We're about out of time here. Is there, um, is there another comment or question?